I'm Sean Watson, and um, I created a project called Rewild My Street, which is based at London Metropolitan University. The uh, sort of premise of this project is that our streets, particularly our residential streets where we live, could be great for nature. Private gardens cover 25% of our cities and they can represent half of urban green space and as much as 86% of urban trees. And you can see from this aerial view of a sort of typical terrace street how much area there is and they're sort of almost like a kind of linear park with the back gardens and front gardens highlighted there. But they also sort of form habitat corridors that could connect into wider, larger green spaces such as allotments, cemeteries, parks and so on. Unfortunately, um, the trend is that these spaces are becoming less green and more grey and one quarter of our front gardens, for example, have been paved over. And people are also generally changing back gardens to have less green cover, to have more artificial lawns or less tree cover and so on. So we really need to rewild our urban streets to allow them to become green havens that are great for wildlife and therefore great for people and our own contact with nature. So that's the kind of project vision and we wanted to create a website to help residents to rewild their homes. So it has information on species uh, that you could attract to your street, home and garden in an urban area, on mini habitats that you could create, on products that you might buy to attract wildlife to your home, or alternatively on activities that you could do with your family and neighbours to make your street more wildlife friendly. And the website is rewildmystreet.org. And my background is as an architect and designer. And so the website is arranged around what we call vision drawings, which we use to sort of organise all that guidance. And the idea is that they could help inspire people to understand how their street could be transformed and how it could look if they and their neighbours make small changes that add up across the whole street. So, for example, we have this uh, sort of sectional drawing through a typical house and garden and showing the street in the distance to talk about the kind of species that you might attract and some of them are highlighted here. And for example, if you want to attract the UK's uh, favourite mammal, the hedgehog, which unfortunately is in very drastic decline, then we have keys for all the drawings which link through to external guidance because there's loads of great guidance out there from conservation bodies. And the idea is that this helps to sort of curate that guidance and make it relevant to an urban context. So if you wanted to find out about the, the prickly hedgehog, you click here. And then we go to Hedgehog Street's website where there's loads of information about all about the hedgehog. We have a sort of street plan drawing, which is looking down on the street here. So you can see the row of terraced houses in white and then um, quite sort of more radical proposals for the, the front, for the street, um, but that work with an existing street layout and still allow practical things like the, a bin truck and a fire truck to come down the street. But with lots of sort of um, modular things that could be brought in to increase the amount of trees and, and planting, um, allow people to park bikes and use the street as a, a play park for their children to play safely, um, whereas the rest of the street might become a kind of electric carpool for, for sort of shared cars for residents. And then the back gardens are more of a focus on sort of um, individual actions. So one person might create a pond, 
One person might put up a bat box, one person might make a mini meadow, but there might be some joined up thinking about maybe everyone trying to have a hedge as the boundary to the um, front garden. And then this talks about mini habitats. So if you wanted to create a mini meadow on part of your lawn, you would again look on the, the key. And most of these drawings are arranged into sort of zones that most um, people would have. So a street, a front garden, a house, a patio, a lawn and a shed zone. And so this is in the in the lawn zone for the meadow. And then that links through to Kew Gardens information on why meadows are, are so important. Then we use the sort of uh, elevations, as we call them, the front um, and back view of, of all the houses in the terrace to talk about uh, product solutions that you can buy off the shelf if you want a sort of quick, easy way to achieve something. Um, and so if you were interested in creating a um, container pond, as I've shown here in the back garden on the, the lawn zone, then that would link through to somewhere where you can buy an off the shelf uh, pond kit, which will come kind of complete with, with everything apart from the, the water, which you let the, the rain do. Um, and you can plant up, up with native um, aquatic plants to attract lots of wildlife quite instantly. A pond is a really great magnet for wildlife. Um, alternatively, if you want to get more hands-on, um, spend less money and spend more time outside making changes yourself, every um, product option that we have also has an activity where you can do it yourself. And this is shown on this kind of aerial view of the street, which really tries to show the character of that sort of play park that the main street has been turned into and shows sort of people um, getting out and enjoying the street and their back gardens and doing activities like digging a mini pond or um, putting up a bat box and so on. And so if, if here you wanted to create your own pond like this guy is doing, then that is in the, the lawn zone again. And that links through to RSPB's uh, activities and their suggestion for creating a mini pond, which could be in something as simple as, as an old sink or, or tub like this one here. So what can you do to get started? You can sign up to rewildmystreet.org and you'll get this free guide. This is the contents page with five kind of step-by-step step activities to help you get started. So we've got um, for a quick fix, putting down a log pile, for instant impact, creating a window box, to attract the most wildlife, making a mini pond, to get crafty with your kids, to create a bee hotel, and for connectivity and thinking about joined up thinking with your neighbors to create a, a wildlife gap. So when you um, go onto the website, you'll get this um, pop up where you can sign up for that. And you also get our monthly uh, wild makeover tips. Here they are. Um, so every month we send out a, a seasonal tip. And again, with lots of links to help you um, find information about products and activities and species and habitats. And these are some of the um, previous ones that we've done. Our most recent one last month was about creating a veg patch and how to do that in a way that will benefit wildlife without using pesticides and by creating homes for hedgehogs and toads and things that will be natural predators for those pests. Um, and considerations of things like using peat-free compost to avoid some wider environmental damage from things you're buying. Um, and always trying to say that even if you have a small space, you might not have a, a massive or, or even a small garden. If you even have just a balcony or a few containers, you can still achieve a lot of these things. We're also on social media, media even on Twitter and Instagram at Rewild My Street. 
And for example, for 30 Days Wild, which is an initiative from the Wildlife Trust, every day in June, we issued a new image and these were, were some of them. And we call these pattern drawings and they're, they're little illustrations for each sort of activity that will show you the, the sort of design and considerations for how to integrate them into an urban setting. Um, so to, to show one of them in a bit more detail, this is for creating a, a wildlife gap. So thinking about how that would look, but how it might also be planned out and the strategy for trying to have a wildlife gap in every one of your boundaries, obviously in discussion with your neighbours, and what size that would need to be to allow um, things like hedgehogs to, to get between gardens and also toads and frogs and other considerations about maybe not making your fences too high so other animals like foxes and, and squirrels can jump over them easily. So over to you really to um, take on the challenge to rewild your own streets. Um, here are the kind of details again. So rewildmystreet.org for the website and you'll see there's loads of um, resources and news about events like this that we're doing and lots of other information there. And at rewildmystreet on Twitter and Instagram, please do join our community. We'd love to hear about what you've done, um, either on social media or on via the website, you can become a member and join our forum where we have an archive of all our monthly tips. And we also encourage you to tell us your stories and post your pictures about your rewilding projects. So we'd really like to hear what happens in in Eastbourne and, and anywhere else you're listening in, in from. I hope that has um, inspired you and given you some information to get started. Um, thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. You should, see, you should see some questions in the ask a question or and in the chat. I think there's some coming through. Yes, I'm just having a look through. So um, competitions and prizes, if I go through in kind of reverse order, um, we don't run competitions. We enter competitions our, ourselves, if that's what you mean. So the, the project came about through a competition win, actually, for the Imagine London as a National Park City Design Ideas competition, which was an international competition. So we were one of the winners with our first drawing, which was the first uh, sort of section drawing with the species that, that I showed. Um, so we tried to, tried to do that. Um, let's see, do we have any thoughts on gorilla rewilding or gorilla wilding? Um, yes, I think all good if you don't get caught. Um, so I think, um, yeah, it's great. I mean, generally, if you're sort of helping out the the council and your neighbours by maybe watering your local tree pit or, or adding a few sunflowers to it or something, I don't think there's any harm in that. And I think it it's all good and it can kind of bring um, people together. Obviously, any anything more serious than that, you would have to check if you need um, permission from your council. There are also ways to contact your council, maybe if you want more trees planted or something, a lot of them have um, kind of request forms and things where you can ask for tree planting in a certain area and they'll check the sort of feasibility of it. Um, hello from Plymouth, thank you, I grew up in Plymouth, so that's good, people from all over, East Sussex, Old Town, Eastbourne, brilliant, Woolwich, oh, it's a bit nearer to where I am now in London. Okay, so it's great we have people from all over. Um, what hedge plants are best for attracting wildlife and, and pollinators? 
Yes, I think that's a really good point. Um, I have a mini hedge in my garden and we went for a, a hornbeam in the end because that's a native plant. It does well on the clay soil that we've got here and it sort of provides all round interest because it retains some of its leaves and colour throughout autumn and winter um, and also has kind of catkins for um, for wildlife. Uh, I also have ivy, which I think is, is probably actually the best thing. I know people are, are sometimes quite polarised about whether they like ivy or not, but um, it really is an amazing, it's a native plant, obviously it, it grows well, it can form a hedge or a climber, and it's a really good late source of nectar if you leave the flowers to grow. Um, at, th at this kind of time of the year and then in sort of January a good late source of, of berries it gets the black berries for um, kind of birds and so on to feast on but with all hedges it's about um, trying not to be control them too much and you know being careful to not cut them at the wrong times of year so be careful to avoid cutting them in spring when birds might be nesting in them try to leave some flowers on for, for pollinators and try to leave some berries on for wildlife over the winter. So I think that's the main thing. Um, I am actually in a couple of weeks through the, um, the through London Metropolitan University where I work, we're going to plant a hedge for wildlife on a, on a city farm in um, right in the middle of, of London. And we're using a mix of plants we've, we've got a grant from the woodland trust and if you look on their website they have a, a wildlife hedge pack which has about five different species which are all aimed at providing a good hedge for wildlife and i think it has off the top of my head uh, blackthorn hawthorn uh, common oak um i think alder so a kind of mix mix of sort of native species really and a, a mix would always be best if you have enough enough space to do that because it might give offer different things to different species and at different times of the year um someone has seen a great example of a scented I ivy hedge brilliant yeah but i think just the fact of having a, a hedge rather than a fence or a wall can help all wildlife if you've got space space for one um obviously it, it sort of gets around that issue of having connectivity between individual gardens which can be a real problem things like hedgehogs need more space than one garden to to survive um, so if we can make sure wildlife sees sees our gardens as one big space rather than the individual plots that we define them as then then that's really important uh, some questions in the ask a question box. Maybe I'm not seeing that, am I? Just on the bottom bar in about the middle. Okay, yes. Apologies. Okay. So during lockdown, the grass verges on pavements were left uncut. And during the spring this year, many wildflowers grew, attracting pollinators and birds. Can policy be changed? Um, yeah, hopefully. I mean, I know that um, the organisation Plant Life are doing a lot of lobbying um, on social media and such on that and sending petitions and stuff to, to councils and government. Because um, I think in lockdown, yes, a lot of sort of verges and stuff and um, areas of sort of council owned land were left to their own devices a bit more and there were some great impacts, as you said. Um, also, they were spraying less with, with pesticides, which is a real issue in kind of towns and, and cities for, for council managed areas. So, um, yes, hopefully, and people are, are on the case with that, I think. Um, what's the best argument for people who like lawns tidy? So um, I'm not against tidiness. And as a, a sort of slightly ACD architect, I, I like a certain amount of tidiness as well. And a lot of my research is about how to sort of sell rewilding and make it acceptable in a kind of urban environment. So I think it's important to have, you can have a sort of clipped area of lawn and you can have a clipped area of hedge. And I think it's about contrasting some of those elements and using them, 
using them as structures to sort of frame slightly wilder areas so that we can accept those slightly wilder areas. So for example, um, in my garden, I have a, a mini meadow and it, it looks great at certain times of the year and at other times it looks um, to some people's eyes slightly messy, let's say. But we have that sort of edged with a brick edging and then we have sort of rusted hoops to sort of help contain the, the grasses and things to, to make it look like it's it's a little bit messy, but it's within a kind of neat frame. It's kind of intentional. So I think those kind of moves are important. If people like a tidy lawn, you can have a balance. So you can have, you can let parts of it grow long, or you can have a meadow and you can mow a path through it. And that sort of then looks quite intentional and quite um, looked after. So you can still get a look that something's cared for and that something's neat and maybe acceptable to more people but it's, it's about thinking about how it's designed. And obviously that, that's where this project tries to help people is to sort of share those simple design ideas that can make this stuff look, um, look right in, the, in an urban context. Um, let's move down these a little bit more. Um, is there any legislation we can use to campaign with local councils so our gardens can link with parks? um so i think it's um i think it's more about talking to your neighbors in a way and um you know sometimes your gardens might not link directly with parks but for something like birds that, that and insects that can fly it's a short hop and then i think it's making sure that our gardens themselves can connect up with hedges or wildlife gaps as we've talked about and obviously there are those things like like tree planting and lobbying your council about that kind of thing that can help then make those sort of aerial um, jumps that wildlife can do to, to get to parks and gardens more easily. And um, for high rise flats, yeah, yeah, I, I didn't um, I didn't include it, unfortunately, but on our um, website, we have a balcony drawing. So it's one of these kind of vision drawings. Um, for a sort of typical balcony and showing how much you can sort of fit in. So it has things like uh, a sparrow box. So if you're, if you're high up, certain species like sparrows and swifts like to be high up. Um, same would go for bats and stuff like that. So you can put up those kind of habitat boxes. Um, you could also put one of those container ponds on a balcony. Um, or you can get hanging bird feeders and bird baths and things like that. You can also grow things in containers, obviously, including growing things up high, so using kind of climbers and so on. So I think there's loads that can be done in balconies, and we do um, have a drawing if you go onto the website and, and search balcony in, in our sort of forum area, it will come up um, with that drawing. Uh, best plants for pots, those who don't have garden spaces, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, loads of things will grow in a pot, really, even um, I've, I've been growing things like blueberries, so even sort of small um, fruit trees and, and stuff like that, and uh, vegetables like carrots and stuff. Um, you could grow a, a mini meadow in a, in a pot by just sowing some annual mix of wildflower seeds um it doesn't really limit you as long as you're sort of prepared to to water it and maybe you know thinking about things that need less water like uh, mexican daisies i've got in my window boxes at the moment which have a really long flowering period and you know cope with a bit of neglect and things like like lavender and stuff i think it's um you know just making sure you can manage the watering and that that pots require is the only really constraint, real constraint. And, and as I said, you can also have water plants in a, in a pot, create a, a mini pond, as long as you make sure there's some sort of ramp or something to help wildlife get, get in and importantly out. Um, that's good. Um, we're sadly ed adding every year to our collection of meter high elm stumps on our streets. What can we do with them that looks good and does good? Okay, so I assume that's to do with um, the council 
cutting them down because of complaints or something or disease. Anyway, um, it's the disease, sadly, and uh, right. The uh, county council, which owns the streets, as it were, uh, won't let us cut them less than a metre high unless we completely redo the pavement, which would cost us £5,000 an elm tree, which we don't have. So right, we're, yeah. we're left with a large collection of these things that it would be nice to do. They'll probably last 100 years. So, Yeah, so, I mean, I guess it would just be planting in the, in the tree pit around them would be my main advice on that um and then you kind of disguise them a bit and at least you're using the the sort of space that was allocated for them for something so again that could be a kind of wildflower mix that was an, an annual mix or something yeah okay i'm just gonna have a look in the chat as well uh, Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely, Ben. That's completely the in, intention that, that design can sort of help, particularly with with doing this in, in urban areas. And, and it's not just about the visual and aesthetic appeal as well, I should say. It's about making use of space effectively. So um, someone's talked about um, green walls. Um, yes, I really like green walls. I think... Um, they can be quite high maintenance if, if they're the, the sort of Patrick Blanc type installation that you'd see in a more, you know, like city centre setting or something, which need a lot of water and should be done with recycled rainwater in an irrigation system rather than using lots of, of water, which is a scarce resource. Um, so I think you can achieve a green wall quite easily by just having climbers and you know, things like ivy that I've talked about, but also maybe honeysuckle, clematis uh jasmine they those kind of things can quite quickly create a, a green wall but you know might just be grown as a climber in a in a pot or border over over a fence um someone was suggesting um using those stumps as, as insect hotels and drilling holes in them i think think that's that's a, a great idea actually so if, if you use the sort of sunny side of the stump and drilled holes of different different diameters in them, um, reasonably deep, then that could create spaces for solitary bees to come. Um, yeah, that's a good idea. And even if they're just you know decaying naturally, they will probably start to form habitat as the the bark maybe breaks away or something for th for things like beetles and so on. So even though they might look um, bit sad to us they they might actually naturally sort of provide a, a resource as they decay uh, mushrooms yeah i've seen like shiitake mushrooms planted in logs and things that could be interesting it might provide some um some food for for wildlife that would probably be more in a sort of shady situation Yeah, and chicken of the woods is a is a fun guy, isn't it? Yeah, that's probably a bit more native than shiitake, isn't it? Might be better. Does anyone else have any any um any final questions or discussion points? Oh, thank you, Pauline. Um, do we have citizen science? Um, I'm more, I'm more would point people to to things like um, RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch and some of the things that that Spring Watch do because I suppose because I'm not a scientist and um, because the idea is that it's more of a strategic project at the moment that is trying to uh, get people like you to act um, and inspire action more than um, I'm not trying to be something I'm not and try, trying to pretend I'm WWF or, or a conservation body, I guess. 
Uh, so that's the idea. But I think, you know, there are loads of great citizen science things out there and um, apps like the iNature, which are really good at, at collecting data that you can use. Uh, what difficulties have local governments placed in your way and how have they been overcome? Uh, so the, the app is the iNature. Um, I'll put it here. I think that's right, or is it iNaturalist? I'm just going to check on my phone where I've got it. Uh, but it's really good. You basically um, open it up and take a photo of an animal or plant that you see, and then it gives you a likely iNaturalist. Thank you, Ben. You're on it. Um, it gives you a, a likely identification based on your on your location and obviously the the picture. Uh, so it's really handy tool for identifying things. But then by you sort of submitting your thing, which you can do, sharing your location or not as as you want, um, can help contribute to citizen science. Um, so capturing the actions. Uh, yes, the idea is that the forum um, starts to do that, but I'd like more people to engage with that and people sort of seem to be more interested in, in telling us about things through social media than, than through, through the forum, but that's fine. Um, and also this sort of piece of research that I'm doing at the moment, um, which is with a colleague in, in behavioural science, is about trying to um, find out things about um, how people are using the website and how it could be um, improved to help encourage people to um, look after the environment and look after wildlife. So I'll be creating sort of data as part of that. Um, Plymouth City Council has started to rethink their behaviour. Good. <laughs> I'll, I'll check that out next time I'm, I'm down at my parents there. Um, yeah, I think I think a lot of um, councils and stuff are, are changing, and that that's great. And um, yeah, obviously there is the sort of link with improving everyone's health and well-being, as as that that suggests, presumably. Um, yeah, so I think community groups working together. Yeah, in Tring. Um, there's a group in uh, through Friends of the Earth in um, Stoke Newington um, who have a postcode gardener and they have funding for this postcode gardener who goes around and, and helps people in that in that postcode um, do things to rewild their front gardens and things. So there are some sort of small initiatives and um, there are other sort of funding things here through um, the mayor and the Greener Cities Fund, but I'm sure there are things elsewhere as well that can provide funding, which tends to be tends to be for sort of people who are a sort of registered charity as a community group. So it would tend to need to be a reasonably formal community group. But obviously there can be more informal things like maybe people who are on an allotment together and get together to make their allotment wilder or something like that. Okay, and yeah, nature hoods are really good. I know, um, I know the guys there. Um, yeah, they're doing really great things, mainly in sort of Oxford and Swindon at the moment. Um, but yeah, it looks like they're going to be telling everyone about it later as well. I'm just seeing if I feeling I missed something in the chat. Okay, there's a question about local governments, isn't there? Yeah. Um, so I guess I haven't directly experienced any problems with local governments, but in a way the project comes out of the of sort of policy barriers because the problem there are huge opportunities with residential private gardens, as I've hopefully convinced everyone, but there is very little to stop people doing what they want with their gardens which might be um 
through lack of awareness or whatever, not great for nature or very bad for nature. There's no, unless, you know, you have a, a tree that's subject to a tree protection order or something, or you're in a conservation area where you have to keep a, a privet hedge at all times, like um, Hampstead Garden suburb near me, um, there's not much to control what you do. There, there is now a, a planning law to that you need planning permission if you're going to pave over uh, more than five meters squared of your front garden. But I'm sure a lot of people don't don't know about that, and that's more about um, flood risk than it is about wildlife. So it's more you could have porous hard surface without it necessarily being green and good good for wildlife. So I think the whole project sort of comes comes out of um, barriers because a lot of the things that are talked about with biodiversity tend to be done through legislation and policy to do with new buildings or things that require planning permission maybe um, having a condition to have a green reef or a, a green wall or something um, whereas there's very little control over residential areas particularly back gardens Uh, greening stations yeah I don't know loads about that I know lots of them uh, um, quite into sort of uh, having floral displays and so on for um, the sort of stations in bloom awards aren't there um, how how wildlife friendly their focus is I don't know but it's got to help <laughs> yeah those are the days aren't they public transport Okay, yeah, great. Some examples of, of kind of community initiatives around station. Yeah, and I think it, it seems to that seems think seems to be sort of fairly random and very much down to the individual personalities who are um, who are involved. But it's it's really great to see, isn't it? it? Really brightens your day when you see something like that. <laughs> hopefully that's that's their bonus for um for working there i'm going to just pop our um balcony drawing in into the chat actually so that as i mentioned that so that you can see that those of you who are interested and I think, you know, it needn't just be a balcony as well. You could apply um, the ideas to any any school space, really. Let me just look it up. Okay, I'm going to pop that in. That will work. So, yeah, if, if anyone wants to look at that that balcony drawing, you can see a link there in the chat, which takes you through to the forum bit of our website. Yes, yeah, so I think it's great that there are all these little um, projects. It'd be be nice if everything was a bit more um, joined up and a bit more of a standard approach, but it's all it's all a good start. And I think the fact that you know you guys are kind of noticing these things and noticing how it lifts your day, doing something as as kind of potentially mundane as as commuting as as we used to in the <laughs> in the pre-pandemic days, um, you know, it really makes you realise how that that sort of contact with any tiny bit of nature particularly in the in a sort of urban setting is um is really valuable and really helps our need
Yeah, sparrows are in um, really big decline. I don't know if people saw that that um, edition of, of Autumn Watch last week or the week before, but um, yeah, and it's it's not completely known why that is. So anything we can do to help sparrows, um, particularly if you've got some in your area, because they're quite Un, they're quite unlike, unwilling to give up existing territories, but sometimes if those territories get lost because a hedge is taken down or something, um, or they just need more space because they've been successful breeding, then it's great to provide something nearby. The same if you've got swifts in your area, if you see those in the summer um, over your streets, really good to put up a, a swift box because they're really, um, you know, short of of places to go they used to go in kind of gaps and buildings and so on and we don't um you know we try to make everything very leak proof now and we don't have all those sort of natural or not natural but but man-made accidental gaps if you like where where um bats and swifts and so on can call call home so yeah, sparrow terrace really good. And they also like both sparrows and swifts and starlings like to sort of nest in groups. So um, the sparrow terrace is good because it has several nest boxes together, literally in a, in a terrace. Um, and you know, things like swifts, it's really good to play swift songs. I'm still trying, I've got a nest box outside my window here and I'm still trying to get swifts although I, I see them nearby hopefully they've just got enough space already and I play uh, swift calls between sort of May and August when they're around to try and entice them in because if you make them think there's already a colony there with some nice noisy neighbours they're more likely to come and you have swifts coming into your roof brilliant um any tips sarah uh, sorry going back to yours on community streets coming together and using group buying power green roofing on several properties rather than a single one um i mean i think that's that's a great idea um i don't really have any examples of it but i don't see why it it, it couldn't work and you know it could be that sort of joined up and I think in our sort of drawings we've shown a mixture of maybe suggestions where neighbours might get together and suggest that there's a you know, continuous hedge or a um, swathe of meadow that runs through all the back gardens but um, it can also be a patchwork and sometimes gardens are such good habitat because people have lots of different tastes and so on and, and it naturally that naturally generates a patchwork of habitats rather than a, a sort of monoculture because someone will will love a certain type of flower and someone will go for a more naturalistic planting and so on. So, so sometimes the individualism is is good as well, but definitely if, if your neighbours are all on the same page, everyone's got WhatsApp groups and so on these days, it's it's great to sort of try and find like-minded people to, to club together with too. Okay, Ben is going over to do his own talk for Naturehood. So yeah, um, that will be really great. So I encourage everyone to to go and listen to to Ben on that. They're doing some really great great work too, and um, we'll sort of expand more on on this kind of theme. So um, yeah, if this interested you, that will be a great great follow up too. Okay, um, Joe, great as a living roof installer. So living roofs are yeah, basically a biodiverse green roof. Trying to get the council involved in a community project. That's about funding them permissions. Okay. Um, yeah, so it could be, I mean, you've got to be a bit careful with things about like weight, haven't you? And um, planning permissions if it was in a conservation area or something, but generally a lot of councils are quite pro green roofs um certainly on on new buildings so i don't see why not on retrofitting if it's if it's sort of structurally possible but um yeah it could well be is there a kind of flat green roof you'd recommend for wildlife so um 
Yeah, I mean, Joe can probably answer that better than me. But I think um, it's rather than going for sedums, which are, are sort of require the, the least amount of, of soil, so maybe sort of 180 mil even, um, but have fairly limited wildlife value in that they sort of provide pollen for bees at certain time of the year when they're in flower. But other than that, they're not kind of native plants here. So I would say going for more of a kind of uh, wildflower mix um, as, as a kind of green roof. And, you know, great if you can add things to it, like mini log piles and things as well to provide some extra habitat. And, and we show things like, you know, bin store with a green roof. And um, I have on, on my shed a sort of cheat screen roof where I've grown a, a passion flower over the top of it, which which looks quite good. And achieves a sort of similar effect without having to worry about the the structural issues and the slope of it because it has a, a very pitched roof um, but flat is is generally good as long as you've got a tiny bit of a of a slope to allow drainage yeah sorry i'm sure i'm sure naturehood has expanded and they, they will tell you loads more about it um in their talk so do do join that too yeah okay so thank you so much everyone for your questions and your comments and your time um do tune into nature hoods as well as i say i i know those guys they're doing a really amazing work and they're sort of much more the on the ground side of, of this kind of thing so it's a different perspective um, please do sign up to everything social media if you're on it and the and the website and yeah we'll um reach out to you with our november wild makeover tip very soon <laughs>